Hi, my name is Christopher Kamali and I am a JMU alumnus and current graduate assistant. The purpose of this program is to inspire viewers, one, to further their understanding of environmental sustainability challenges, and two, to actively engage in solutions that help build a sustainable future. These videos were assembled from existing material by the JMU Institute for Stewardship of the Natural World, which promotes the collaborative efforts of the university to pursue environmental stewardship and sustainability and a broader sense of citizenship to highlight how your experience at JMU could prepare you with the knowledge and skills needed to make informed decisions about environmental sustainability. Opportunities to learn about the environment and sustainability in courses are not limited to students in environmental programs. In addition to offering majors that prepare students for environmentally focused careers, JMU provides concentrations, minors, and general education courses that enable any student to develop the knowledge and skills to contribute to a sustainable future. A lot of times we're brought up to think that nature is out there somewhere and we're here and we don't have anything to do with it. But we completely rely on it for food and water and energy and spirit, uh, frankly. It's important for us to know about, to be intimate with, to be comfortable with, and to understand because the way that our culture lives and the decisions that we make influence the environment every single day. Environmental literature is literature that has as its focus our relationship with the environment. How do the places that we live in affect us? How do we affect those places? How are we sustained by the water and the wildlife and the trees, the beauty around us, and how do we affect them? Teaching and research and writing all go together for me. I think the chance to stand in the classroom and talk with students and hear their thoughts and, and share with them the experiences I've had and the literature that I know is a really wonderful one. Just as research is, I think teaching is a form of discovery. Every day in the classroom, I'm discovering students saying wonderful things, but it also just talking with them makes me think about and discover things that I hadn't thought about before. JMU is a good fit for what I do because it allows me the freedom to be who I am, to flourish as a teacher, to flourish as a writer, to flourish as a member of the community. So I teach food writing and a food studies class that is for um, future middle and elementary school teachers. And so that food studies class is very interdisciplinary, but focuses both on food cultures, where the students themselves come from with food, as well as, you know, other cultural experiences with food, which leads us into talking about different systems of production. In the food writing class, we also talk about different systems of production, particularly when we're looking at more literary journalism, like um, Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma, and things like that. And so um, we go on these field trips in part to see those different systems of production, particularly in um, poultry production. So one of the main reasons that I take students on um, field trips, the one to Mike Weaver's farm in West Virginia, um, where he grows uh, chicken for the Pilgrim's Pride Corporation, and then to Polyface Farms, which is a farm whose values are built around sustainable agriculture in Swope, Virginia, is because for quite some time now, there's been quite a separation between the food on our plate or the foods we buy in the store and its source, where it comes from. And there's such a separation between human beings consuming that food and how it was made. And so one of the goals of the field trips is to really collapse that, dif that, that distance um, and let, you know, all of us there together, me, the students, and, you know, sometimes parents join us, sometimes friends join us to have that opportunity to actually get a clearer and up close picture of how that food gets on their plate.
Polyface was like obviously not conventional. And so I wanted to kind of see the difference. And in class, we had like read Omnivore's Dilemma. We had seen movies. And then I'd heard Professor Kavanaugh mm-hmm. talk about Joel Salatin a lot. So it like just piqued my interest. And I definitely wanted to go check it out. I was really interested in seeing the difference between the two farms because I've heard Polyface is this a lot better in how he runs the farm. I wanted to like go out there and I wanted to see for myself firsthand what it was all about. I just wanted to feel like there was hope in the farming industry and that everything wasn't so industrialized and just um, so based on profit. And I definitely got that when I went to Poly Face Farms. Yes, I wanted to see what Erica had to say. Um, so I really respect her um, as a teacher and educator. So I kind of wanted to see her perspective on things. And I just wanted to go back. Um, farms change very frequently. There are just animals moving around all the time, new things growing, seasons make farms just look completely different and so I just wanted a chance to go again and just see the changes that have been happening. I really like the way that Joel Salton has everything set up and I really liked his transparency. We were able to just walk through the um, fields where the chickens were, we went where all the pigs were and actually like we're playing with the pigs. So I thought that was really cool that he's just so open about it. He really cared about his animals. I mean, the animals, everything he did was designed with the animals in mind. He had special feeders for the pigs, you know, where they could lift their nose up because they that's what they like to do, is like in their nature. And um, he moved them around, they weren't cramped up. It just seemed like he was really committed to uh, putting things the way that they're supposed to be like, in nature and just kind of playing off of nature and like what was best. That Joel Salton is a grass farmer because grass is where everything starts. It comes from the ground up. The, like, the animals eat that, take it, takes that into, into themselves, then we eat the meat, etc. I was just interested in, in the grass, especially with its, its springtime. We have that new, new spring of fresh grass coming up. It was interesting to like look at the grass and how like green it was and how um, it was kind of discussed as like a salad bar for the cows. And it was cool to see how he moves his animals, like the pigs, and he moves the cows um, so they don't like ruin their grass. I'd heard about Sometimes I'm asked why I teach food studies and it's it's a great way to I mean food is this great metaphor. I mean it's both something real and it's a great metaphor for talking about labor, for talking about health, for talking about the environment, for even talking about one's own identity and how food is attached to that. And the interconnections between all of these things that no one piece, the labor or the identity or anything like that is isolated, um, but, uh, but they're interconnected. And I think food helps us see those interconnections. The main thing that I'm, that I'm hoping for is for you know any of us as observers not to take things for granted, whether that's our food or the labor that goes into making that food, to essentially just encourage more thoughtfulness and more curiosity. I would be lying if I didn't say that I hope that to the degree that one can, depending on their income, that one would make more thoughtful choices about their food. And um, the reason for that is honestly that I want for students as well as for the labor that produces the food. Um, I want them to have better health and for our environment to be um, better care for, cared for. And so I am trying to foster better stewards of the earth. Um, and I think that being a better steward of the earth actually does relate to personal and communal health. Um, and I try to you know, let people come to that on their own based on their own experiences. I wouldn't say changed would be the right word. I would say enhanced. So my knowledge is enhanced. Um, kind of like the punch behind my activism is enhanced. Because I've always been really passionate about food activism and uh, like the local food movement and just knowing where your food comes from and being able to respect and honor the systems that are in place that are feeding you. So. I would say that everything that I saw at Mike's Farm, everything that I saw at Polyface kind of reinforced all of my beliefs in locally grown, well-fed, sustainably raised, you know, happy creatures and plants. Well, going into uh, Mike's Farm, it was kind of a wake-up call. You don't 
at least for me, I never really took a lot of stock into thinking about where my food came from. You know, I just buy bags of chickens at the store and I don't ever like think twice about, you know, their life they had before really or the workers' life that raised them. And so definitely that was kind of a wake up call and you know, after that I actually started, you know, paying a little bit more attention to my labels when I go out and I buy food, you know, trying to get something that's, you know, maybe more organic or chickens that um, seem to have been treated better. So that definitely changed me in that way and just kind of having me think more that it's not just like me going to the grocery store, there's like so much other things that go behind it. It's definitely made me want to eat healthier or try like to eat more um, grass-fed beef. I have never really tried it. I just buy meat from the grocery store. So it's definitely changed my outlook on that. Yeah, it makes me like cautious like when I go to the grocery store, like what foods I choose and looking at labels, looking at if it's grass-fed. I feel like I've learned a lot. Going into Polyface just kind of, like I said, it kind of gave me hope. Like it made me feel so much better about, you know, eating chicken and other types of meats and America in this day and age where as after Mike's I was kind of feeling like, you know, maybe I wanted to go vegetarian. There is a right way to do it and that there's people out there that are doing things right and that um, hopefully at some point people will catch on and it will kind of become more of a movement. And so it just kind of gave me hope for the future that maybe it won't always be like industrial chicken farming and that at some point, someday, it might all be like polyface farms. Going on, I would just encourage people that if given the chance to go see where your where, where your food comes from, go. It's to be part of your food system. Um, if you can even grow something or like even like just plant a tomato plant, buy one from the farmer's market, plant some basil. I would just encourage people to go on those field trips, talk to teachers that 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 know more than you do. That's why we're at school, and. Just plant some things, eat some good food, because the difference is insane. I've had a long-standing interest in the way that human beings and environment come together. Very, very interested always in natural history and culture. I grew up in a very rural part of Virginia and spent a lot of time outside and was always exploring and finding things. And so I had no idea until I came to JMU as an undergraduate myself that this is something I could study and that I could make a living doing something like what I do, which is archaeology. My research area is largely the Appalachians and so I have the opportunity to work in Shenandoah National Park. Uh, we've done work for the city of Harrisonburg and it's work that is always done with students and that was the model that I experienced as an undergraduate uh, at JMU and it's something that I've honored and kept with me the whole time. The work that we do as archaeologists is an element of social justice. Uh, there's a strong element of that because we take very seriously the idea that in doing archaeology we're uncovering stories that have been lost or are known to very few and so um, often the stories of people who have been marginalized are not told. We've done a lot of work on slave dwellings throughout the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, our connections with Montpelier as well have opened that door. University members are actively engaged in partnerships, outreach, and service that build a sustainable community. Through environmentally focused alternative break trips, student organizations, and civic engagement events, you can engage with others that are tackling sustainability challenges. So what I think is really cool about service is we all decided to give our time to a cause we have limited information about and we are unknowing of any direct benefit from this experience. But from coming here and spending time with nine strangers, we get all these secondary benefits, such as like laughing at our similar senses of humor, 
just enjoying company education. We've learned so much about the forest, so much about the Yurok tribe, and um, like manual labor and service as an individual can sometimes be difficult, but in a group of like-minded people, it's much more enjoyable. Like I wouldn't want to stand in below 40 degree water in waders by myself, mm -hmm. but in a group really? of people joking around, it's very fun and I would do it again. JMU really has a, a culture of getting involved and helping out and very service-oriented school I found when I was going here. We've got a class of 7th and 8th graders from Wetzel Middle School. We've got about 15 volunteers from JMU and we've also got a small team of Friends of the Rappahannock staff. So we're here in Madison County, Virginia. We are about a mile away from the Robinson River on a small tributary of the river, installing a riparian buffer. The, the basic idea is to fence off all the streams on the farm to keep the cattle out. And in order to do that, we have to provide watering tanks for the cattle. So now that the streams have been excluded, uh, we can plant trees. We're planting trees because when you plant trees near bodies of water, that has huge impacts on the quality of the water in that body and downstream. If you can install a forested area around a wetland or a moving body of water, the riparian buffer acts as a filter and a buffer keeping pollutants coming off the land. You know, you go through these things in the classroom, you test students on it, they still don't internalize it. But if they can come out here and spend a couple hours and get their hands dirty, then it's, they're gonna remember this. Soil Cycles is Harrisonburg's first bicycle-powered compost collection service. We go around to homes and restaurants around the city, pick up food scraps at people's doors, and convert them to compost with the help of black bear composting. Our goal is to divert food waste from the landfill because food waste in the landfill creates methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas and contributor to climate change. And we also want to make use of the food scraps that are part of the food cycle to put nutrients that we're taking out of the soil when we harvest back in, build our community health, and engage people with thinking about the full cycle of food production and waste and regeneration. So I was working at a restaurant. It was this time where I was learning about waste and had read articles and had learned that the city had stopped recycling. And at that time, I saw this like enormous amount of waste being thrown out and all of this was organic waste. And then I was like, well, this is weird. We have a university that does this right up, up the road and we have all of this waste just down the road. Why don't I just truck it up and then make soil with it? So that's what I did an entire summer. I took all of this waste on bicycles because I don't drive cars and that's the only means to do it and borrowed trailers and trucked up all of this food waste and then composted it the entire summer. And by the end of the summer, we had about 2,000 pounds of compostables, like organic waste that was composted. And that sort of felt like, wow, a single person can take so much waste and convert it to such valuable wealth that is a solution for most of the environmental problems. Then we started thinking bigger. Okay, how can we do this for the entire city? How can we have hubs around? How can we divert most of the waste that comes from the city and make it into this healthy, rich soil? Um, and so that's where it started. <laughs> Thank you.
There's some paper here that could have been composted. It's another apple core. The uh, majority of the waste that ends up here is actually food. You can actually compost some cardboard as long as you shred it up into small pieces. So cardboard can be broken down. It's actually a really good source of carbon. See a lot of K cups. Um, you can actually remove the lids from those and, and dump the coffee grounds out of them and compost that. It's like a tea bag. A lot of paper products that can be composted. So each day there are, there are different uh, waste haulers that are contracted to go out into neighborhoods and, and collect waste and, and bring it all here. And that's, that's hundreds, maybe thousands of trucks every day driving back and forth, dumping thousands and thousands of pounds of trash here at the landfill. Not to mention, yeah, the, the, the machinery that operates and in, in in pushing the, the trash around and, and covering it up and preparing for the next layer of trash. One thing that goes into creating healthy soil is, is introducing a lot of really good nutrients that the, the food waste has back into the soil instead of bringing it here to, to rot and decompose and, and produce methane. So over here we are um, dig digging up the matter, organic matter here. And do you see these? These are all mycorrhizal hyphae that are so important for the soil. And this is what like, soil organic matter can do. It can increase the number of microorganisms and mycorrhiza, mycorrhizal network. Here, like all these white matter. Look at that, that's magic. <laughs> All these mycorrhizal networks. Oh, cool. Hyphase. <laughs> I feel like, you know, as a local business who claims to support our community and or be invested in the environment, um, it's it's our responsibility even to, to take part and take advantage of um, what Soil Cycles has to offer. If, if we can contribute even a little bit, um, you know, the small monthly bill that we get is, is totally worth it. Yeah. So it takes little to no effort uh, composting with soil cycles. Uh, we literally have six buckets, yellow buckets, that we fill up on a daily basis. Um, we dump them into a large bin outside and soil cycles picks it up. It's super simple. Um, they do all of the hard work, all the heavy lifting. Um, the only thing that we really do is, is clean the buckets and take the compost to the larger bins. It's really, really easy. Um, yeah. Often I feel like there is so much focus on climate change and there is such little focus on what an individual can do. And I felt like, you know, I didn't really think that honestly that it would become such a huge organization soil cycles but here's an example that one student over the summer can start something and bring people in and bring a community in and start a community a shift in culture an alternative culture like that is possible that is possible because all of us have the fire we have the drive and it is only a matter of really looking into that and being able to follow that path. And for me, it's, been, it's always been plants, and soil is the most important, important thing for plants. And so in the future, I see soil cycles becoming a co-op with more people interacting, having bicycles for rent, having a composting site in Harrisonburg, diverting more waste, having no scraps go into the landfill, because that's the world we want to live in. We want more of this rich matter, more of this wealth, and not wealth just sitting in a landfill and decaying and producing methane. I want to see our community members, students, friends, people living in this community, really find out like, what is my role? What can I do? What am I passionate about? And how can I use this passion to make this place a better place? Maybe I can go and talk to another friend who has a similar idea. Maybe together we can start something new. And 
this shift in culture is what I see. And I think this shift in culture is what drives a sustainable future. Environmental stewardship and sustainability can be components of undergraduate student research across disciplines. Faculty members and students, many of whom are undergraduates, conduct research and scholarship that addresses sustainability challenges. Holistic problem solving to ISAC class, we were all given a client, and I was given Virginia Clean Cities, and they're a nonprofit who lobbies for clean energy and clean transportation within the state of Virginia. And then they tasked me and two group members with doing an audit of the Harrisonburg bus system, uh, measuring transit buses as well as school buses. And so we took in all that data and we came up with different alternative fuels that could lessen the emissions from the JMU transit bus systems. What really stood out to me about the ISAT program is it's applied science. I like hands-on, this is a real world problem, real world situation, and give me the tools so I can do my best to solve this problem. The opportunities that are prevalent here within my major provided me with the tools that I need to grow into my best possible self. So here we're standing right now is the Shenandoah Valley in the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the, this so it's so lush. There's a lot of grass. Where I come from is considered a semi-arid landscape. What that means is basically a region that's characterized by relatively low rainfall as well as grassland and scrub vegetation. Pastoralists are livestock herders who have adapted to this landscape and the rainy and dry seasons. This is not new. It has been going on since the era of our great fathers. But what we see now are more frequent droughts that are devastating to people's livelihoods. A drought is way worse than a normal dry season, of course, and causes pastoralists to lose significant portion of their herds. Then when it rains again, they try to rapidly build their herds back up. This pattern of accumulation and losses creates a boom bust cycle. And this is essentially what inspired the development of Aramat. Jacob was a student of mine. Uh, I met him as an undergraduate at JMU, and uh, we developed a friendship. And then eventually, when he graduated, he uh, joined our graduate program. And he comes from a, a Maasai community in southern Kenya. And uh, as I learned more about Jacob, I was fascinated with his background, and also uh, came to learn that his, his family had, uh, had undergone uh, some uh, horrific losses because of the uh, famine in that land. And uh, this was what shaped a lot of his interest in doing something about, about that. So he finished his undergraduate program and then he came to JMU and started graduate school. Uh, and when he was in his graduate studies, he took a class of mine in systems modeling. And in that class, uh, Jacob learned how you can use that kind of approach to tackle problems that are very complex and that often involve interactions between humans and their environment. And he was increasingly convinced that this problem of uh, boom and bust, uh, cattle herds being built uh, up uh, to large levels and then famine hitting and the, the herds collapsing, were driven in part by uh, land use issues in his area, ch climate change, as well as some of the cultural values and practices of his, of his people. And he wanted to try and uh, help his people better understand that so that they could be 
more informed in making decisions about how to manage their cattle holdings and their practices as pastoralists. Aramat is a, a game, a board game that was developed for pastoralists, for the Maasai pastoralists. The game has a huge cultural component that takes account into that takes into account the people's culture and the way of life. And so when people play this game, they are they are able to experience what they experience in real life through a board game setting. Because some of the dynamics that we are trying to, to track in the game are completely modeled into the game. And so when they play this game, it's oftentimes hard to tell people what to do with their livestock when you try to have them exp you know deal with the uh, environmental issues that are really affecting their lives and affecting their livelihoods with their livestock. But by providing them uh, a, a board game simulator that mimics their lifestyle and with all the dynamics that are affect their livelihoods model into it. And the key thing here is to have people communicate, talk among themselves and try to see if they can make better decisions on how they play the game so as to avoid the, the, the death of livestock during the drought period. The game does not propose to solve pastoral problems. I mean, make that very clear. One of the great strengths is it brings people together in a low-risk environment to talk about high-risk issues, um, and that's no small thing. You now, people love this game, so we've piloted the game in multiple communities now um, with only men players, men and women mixed players, only women players only Ma speakers, Ma and English speakers, no American students, um, all kinds of different permutations and it's a very powerful experience and people ask to keep it because they want to play it over and over because um, what they say is it makes them better planners so even though there's still a whole bunch of unpredictability they feel like they're slightly better prepared for the unpredictable um, when they're forced to think about these things. Essentially it's an RPG game, role-playing game. Each player has a role as a head of household. So women are like, oh, I'm not the head of household, my husband is, so I'm not gonna play. So the men step up and they play. And they'll sit around in a circle around the game board, just like their bone with a circular structure. So this symbolism of community. And even though the women say they don't wanna play, they're very close and very like peering over the shoulders of people and uh, of the players. And they'll say, you know, they'll, before the men will make decisions, they'll say, you know, you should think about your kids or, you know, what about school fees? Because this is like their real life now. They've taken on this persona. They feel, they feel, you know, when they lose a cow in the game, they feel it. And, you know, it's in their, it's like real life. There are people who actually have started meetings with elders by playing the game. You know, they have people come over early and or stay late to play the game. And so that, that means that it's, it's not just a pastime. They're, they're, they're getting something out of it. So the game can be adapted to serve other communities as well, facing similar but slightly different issues. As for the community, um, there's lots to be done. I think the solutions to the problems very much come from within the communities themselves. We hope that this will be able to have people experience these things and these events in, in a board game setting and take this and in practice in their own livelihoods. The Madison Trust is a great example of how we can engage donors in a new and exciting and collaborative way to support ideas and energy and entrepreneurship at the university and to take ideas and make them into realities. Out here today we are working on data collection for my thesis research for my master's degree and I am looking at studying interstitial space and oystery for restoration. Bailey is taking these oyster tiles that we've, we've invented and putting them in the bay, which is our, you know, it's our first massive prototype. So we need to find ways to help support new upcoming populations. And my research is focusing on if there is an optimal amount of space in between oysters that will help to better facilitate oyster growth and survival of new populations. Oh. 
The reason that it's important is that 99% of historic global oyster populations are gone. Um, which is a huge amount, and people were using these as their food resources and as their economic resources. So the overall hypothesis of this project is that if we install oyster reefs that are artificial but look like real reefs, maybe we can facilitate the growth of these reefs faster. Bailey's work is going to inform the long-term design, but also how we, we put it into a scale-up production. We started to have some preliminary findings. Uh, it looks like our data is leaning towards supporting our hypothesis of there being an optimal amount of space. Working with the investors that I've, I've gotten to know, and then everybody working through Madison Trust, has really given me confidence as a researcher. For me, it was everything. I love the fact that we are able to give money, but to see where it's actually going and to see the impact that it could potentially have for the homeowners and the people on the river was, was really moving. We're talking to you know state level officials about coastal resilience. So it's bringing JMU into the conversation about coastal resilience. And that wouldn't have happened without the Madison Trust. That is a direct consequence. Thanks to Madison Trust Grant, I have been able to um, get the supplies that I needed for this research and get the gear that I needed to even be here.